Welcome to Good Common Classroom Writer Workshop, Iceberg Lecture Number 4. Greg Kurtz here. In addition to this presentation, I've included a two-page handout that you'll find handy. We've been talking about the concept of the iceberg as it applies to writing. Donald Murray sums it up best with this line. When most people think of writing, they see words on a page all neatly marching toward a meaning. When writers think of writing, they see a blank page and they see what was before the blank page. Do you remember the five-day challenge that I gave you several weeks ago? I asked you to take your writer's notebook and tape in an old photograph on a blank page. Then use pre-writing techniques to look with the eye of a writer to look until you see something. Clusters and maps and free writes and exploration drafts and then a plan. That led you to the writing part of the writing process and eventually to the revising. Right now, I'd like you to take your writer's notebook and let's take four minutes to look at the pre-writing you've done for the, the last few weeks. Try to find one example of pre-writing that worked for you. Look at your pre-writing with the eye of a writer. Look until you see something in your pre-writing. Spend about a minute looking and then lock on to one that worked for you and write about your pre-writing for three minutes. I did it too. I found in my pre-writing writer's notebook, I found this sample. It was an exploration draft. I obviously did two in a row, five minutes each, but I really liked the first one. In pre-writing, I was able to get inside the minds of the people who were in the photograph. I was proud of that. Now let's go back to your writer's notebook. Let's take a few minutes right now to look at the writing you've done in the last few weeks. You'll spend about a minute finding a piece of writing that worked for you, and then about three minutes writing about what made it work for you. I did it too. I looked in my writer's notebook and I found this cumulative sentence attempt. You see the formula listed there and then you see me fill in the formula. Again, it's about that photograph of the graduate and his mama. I like this one a lot because this cumulative sentence ended up landing in my final draft. So it came early, but it lasted late. We've talked about pre-writing quite a bit. You guys are getting very good at that. We've talked about writing and your writing is improving. We haven't spent much time talking about revising. The Writing Center at the University of North Carolina posted this. Revision literally means to see again, to look at something from a fresh critical perspective. It is an ongoing process of rethinking the paper, reconsidering your arguments, reviewing your evidence, refining your purpose, reorganizing your presentation, reviving stale prose. Donald Murray adds to that thought. The writing process is recursive. We move from an emphasis on collecting, to focusing, to ordering, to developing, to clarifying, but it is not a neat linear process. Two words there need some clarification, recursive and linear. So let me try to explain it like this. Across the top and bottom of the page, you see a very linear arrangement. There's three steps in the writing process, pre-writing, writing, revising, all very linear. Down at the bottom, we start before the blank page, you follow the dotted line, you end up with a final draft. It's all very linear, but it's not really. So if you look in the middle of the page, in the pre-writing stage, we're collecting and focusing and ordering. We're collecting details. That's why we use those pre-writing techniques. We're focusing those details. We're ordering them as we develop a plan. Again, that's all in pre-writing. But sometimes when we're ordering the details, we realize we need to take our focus in a different direction. And that leads us back to a sensory map or a cluster because we have to recollect. So we're not moving forward, we're moving backward while we move forward. Well, eventually we're in the writing part of the writing process. That's where we develop our ideas. Our paragraphs start to fill out. But in filling out paragraphs, sometimes we notice our focus has changed. Sometimes a piece of writing takes on a mind of its own. That forces us to go back and collect more details. And as we develop, we're collecting again. Eventually, we're closer to the revision part of the process. We're clarifying our meaning. 
but in clarifying our meaning, sometimes we need to push the order around. Move this paragraph over there, that sentence down to there, that kind of a thing. So you see, it's not a linear pre-writing, writing, revising. You don't just check those, those lists off. You go backwards and forwards until finally you do get to your final draft. I got kind of theoretical there, didn't I? Maybe I need to show it to you in action. For me, sometimes that helps. All right, so here's one of the photographs that I taped into my journal during the five-day challenge. I have no idea who these people are. I asked my parents, after all, I found the photograph in a box of their stuff that's in my garage, hundreds of family photographs. I said, Mom, Dad, who is this? They have no idea. So as I looked at this photograph, I had to look with the eye of a writer. I had to look until I could see something. I had to imagine that there are lines on her forehead, that there are lines on his young forehead. They both look pretty serious. But I made up this story because I have the eye of a writer. And then I drafted this. This is the beginning of draft two. Just look at the first few words. He picked up the black and white photo and looked at it for the first time in seven years. You see revisions going on there, but that sentence tells me what's happening in the photo. Someone is picking up the photo that I taped into my journal. It's actually the graduate, but we'll get to that later. Let me give you three revision tips. Once you get a draft done, number one, work from a printed copy. Print it out. Something happens at the mental level when you have it in front of you in your hands, when you can put a pencil and a pen and a marker and a highlighter to it. Work from a printed copy. Two, read your draft aloud. Oh, it'll feel kind of funny, but you need to hear how it sounds to the ear of your reader. And ask questions as you read and don't flinch. Is it clear? Do you need dialogue? Do you need more detail? Don't flinch. You know how to leverage more details by going back to pre-writing techniques. Here are three strategies. Add, subtract, rearrange. It's all very simple. You add concrete images because you don't want vague images. You subtract clutter. Don't be afraid of putting clutter down in early drafts. We'll clean it up and get rid of it and we rearrange. Sometimes a compound sentence that has part A and part B needs to be part B then part A. Sometimes paragraph three needs to become paragraph one or paragraph seven. You rearrange. Again, I've gotten a little theoretical. I need to show you the tips and the strategies playing out. So the photograph that you see on the left, I'm gonna use that as the launching point for the drafting that I've done for this week's session. You're going to complete three different readings, and you'll do revision, extensive revision in between reading one and reading two, reading two and reading three. In reading one, you want to read for clarity. You're essentially asking the question, is my message clear and how could I improve clarity? So I took my pre-writing, I read all the way through it, I highlighted some things in my pre-writing that I thought needed to end up in my draft as I was making my plan, and draft one, all I've done is I've imported all of those ideas, they're not even paragraph, they're kind of just jammed together, that's draft one, I'm implementing my plan, and I read it, I read it for clarity. Is my message clear? How could I improve clarity? One of the things I discovered was I needed to add dialogue. I need to lobby a little bit for dialogue here. You guys have gotten good at writing description. We started teaching that to you in elementary school. Description, it enlivens the eyes of your reader, but dialogue turns on their ears. So you want to include dialogue to engage the ears of your reader. I knew it and I included it in between draft one and draft two. I took a break after I'd revised, and then I printed draft two. This time, I read it for order. And I asked myself a playful question. What would happen if I rearranged the order of sentences or paragraphs? And then I go to town, and I just have a little bit of fun. You'll notice the order changes in between draft two and draft three, because once I asked the question, I tried it. You notice in draft two that the first paragraph is a fairly lengthy paragraph. 
in draft three, the first paragraph is one sentence, and it's the same sentence from draft two. But I move some things down and move some things up. I took that dialogue, knowing I wanted to engage my readers here, and I moved it to the second paragraph, very close to that first sentence. I took the mama look stoic part and I moved it down and I took all of those details from paragraph one. I didn't want to throw them away. I just pushed them down and edited a few of them out. Then I come back for draft for reading number three. In reading number three, I focus on voice. How does this sound to my reader? Playful, sad, wandering, reminiscent, angry, sarcastic, melancholy. What is the tone of my essay? And I just focus on reading for the voice and the tone. In an effort to let the reader's eyes follow the narrator's eyes as he looks at the photo, is reminiscing drifting into wandering? That was a question that I asked myself as I was reading it for voice and sound. And I discovered something that I wasn't happy about. One of my favorite lines in the whole piece is wandering. It's not needed. It's a great line. I'll save it for another story later. It's right here in the middle. The whole concept of mama arriving early to the graduation. Let me show you the line that I have to take out because it's wandering. Mama always arrived early, early to church, early to daily chores of a farm, early to school, early to bed, not early to get the best seat. She'll sit halfway back on the left, just like she does at church. It's the last part of the thought. It's a great thought. I loved writing it, but I need to save it for a different draft. It's not going to work in this essay. It's just a little bit of clutter. All right, remember your strategies. You add concrete images, you subtract clutter, you rearrange sentences and sections. I've spent quite a bit of time getting myself to draft six. But I haven't read it to you yet. I've just read a sentence here or there. Let me read you where I ended up by draft six. He picked up the black and white photo for the first time in seven years. Look happy, Uncle Dima had called as he snapped the photo moments before they claimed their seats at the high school graduation. He had stood alone with his mama, resolutely, striving to feel joy in the midst of sorrow longing to live in the moment, his accomplishment bereft by the absence of his daddy, mama fulfilling the role of both parents. She stood stoic next to her son. This photo recorded the first public celebration after daddy's death, furrowing mama's forehead with care, forcing her to mask her resolve in Sunday dress, gloved hands, her finest wool suit, shoes that made her ankle swell, daddy's absence stealing the happy from group celebrations. Her husband's heart attack had stolen more than his life. We arrived so early, he remembered. Long before most everyone arrived, before the principal who, who would hand him his diploma, before the teachers who were required to show up 15 minutes before the ceremony, before his classmates, mama controlled early arrivals, early to church, early to the daily chores of a farm, early to school, early to bed, it was her way. She was even early to her own funeral. You'll miss me when I'm gone. You'll wish you had minded me better then, she would bark, leveraging her own future death. Now the threat was upon him. It showed in lines etched in his young face as he flipped through Mama's funeral file and waited for the funeral director to arrive. That's 261 words. I'm not done yet, but I'm well on my way and I feel good about the revision that I've done. I need to point out one more thing. It's the rhetorical parts that I intentionally leveraged in draft six. Alliteration, the occurrence of the same letter or sound at the beginning of adjacent or closely connected words. Yes, that's the first rhetorical device you ever learned in elementary school. And I included it intentionally in my draft. I highlighted it for you in red so that you'll see it. Notice the concentration in paragraphs two and three, and then I back off the alliteration in paragraphs three and four, four and five. I don't want to overwhelm my reader, but I do concentrate in the last sentence, some alliteration with letter F. That's all intentional. There's another rhetorical device that I harness. That's the bookend, the explicit repetition of wording at the beginning and ending of a grammatical construction. 
I used it in a subtle way here, where mama's forehead is lined with care. Then in the last paragraph, it showed in lines etched in his young face. I don't use exact wording. I use conceptual bookend. But I used exact wording here, where he stood alone with his mama, the sentence ended with mama fulfilling. In the next um, cumulative sentence, I do it again with pu first public celebration, becoming group celebrations at the end of that cumulative sentence. I leveraged bookend on purpose. The reader may not notice, but the reader will appreciate it. All right, let's put it all together. As always, I'm going to warm up your writing muscles with three free write journals. You've actually already done the first one, but I need you to reflect on two different Donald Murray quotes and don't do one right after another. Four minute free write, take a break, four minute free write. Then let's go to number two. Assignment number two is to select a piece of writing of at least 300 words from your writer's notebook to revise and publish. Push it through this process. Part A, read it aloud three times for three purposes, and after each reading, free write for four minutes. Read for clarity. Ask in your free write, is my message clear? How could I improve clarity? And after you answer those questions, spend some time in revision. Then take a break. Come back with fresh eyes and read it for order. You'll have to print a fresh copy because you've revised in between. Ask yourself in a free write what would happen if I rearranged the order of sentences or paragraphs, and after you answer that question, then rearrange some of it. Again, take a break, but print a fresh copy for your third read. This time read for voice. How does this sound? Is it playful, sad, wandering, reminiscent? What is the tone of the piece? And after you answer that question, clarify your tone and your voice. Then go to part B. Add, subtract, and rearrange, and spend some time here. Then guess what comes next? You get to publish it. You probably won't publish three drafts like I did on the back of your handout. You're just going to publish your final draft by reading it aloud to a friend. I think I've equipped you for a good week of writing. And I'm eager to see what you do with the third stage of the writing process, revision. Have a good time and take your time. Until next time, Godspeed.